Have you ever looked at the numbers going up on the gas pump and felt nauseous? Have you ever splurged on eating out and found yourself regretting it for days? How about sitting there late at night, running your hands through your hair while crunching the numbers for the third time, hoping that somehow this iteration will come out with a balance that isn't negative? Maybe you're a little more responsible than me and you've never felt those things. But have you ever agonized over a big purchase, wondered where all the money goes, wished your paycheck was a little bigger? Sometimes dealing with finances feels like trying to steer a ship on a storm-tossed sea. Thanks for joining me, I'm Melissa Rote and this is Big Pond Little Fish. Making your own way in the world may feel like you're a very small fish in a very big confusing pond. How do you honor God and pursue your calling while navigating the waters of life in your 20s? On this podcast, we're exploring life, career, family, friends, and calling from the perspective of a young Christian fish trying to make a splash in the world's big pond. Welcome to Episode 8, Choppy Waters, Uncertain Finances. Most fish don't dive into the pond with a lot of money. How do you balance a tight budget, long hours, and honoring God with your finances without being rocked on the waves of worry? A 2021 survey by Capital One found that 73% of Americans ranked finances as the greatest source of stress in their life. Three quarters of American adults are more stressed about money than they are about work, family, health, or any other source of conflict. And as you might guess, that percentage just goes up when you narrow it to millennials and Gen Z. I count myself as part of that percentage. I wish I didn't have to think about money, but instead I find myself constantly checking my bank account. When thinking about and planning for this podcast episode, I knew it was an important topic in young adult life, but I kind of felt like I was the last person who should be talking on finance. I don't live in some beautiful house, eat fancy meals, drive a nice car, and have it all put together. I live in an apartment with a roommate, shop the generic grocery brands at Walmart, and drive a 2005 Outback whose check engine light has been on the entire time I've owned it. I can't remember the last time I bought new clothes, definitely not in the past couple of years. And I get buyer's remorse from eating at Panda Express. But I don't think talking about finances is all about giving tips on accumulating wealth. There are plenty of books and articles and seminars on that. I'm not going to try to do that for you. But how do you live your life in that awkward, renting a crappy apartment, thinking Olive Garden is the pinnacle of bougie, buying your furniture off Facebook Marketplace stage, in a way that honors God and minimizes stress? So first, let's talk about some general ideas, and then we'll dive into some tips and tricks that I think are especially helpful for 20-somethings. Something I have to remind myself of is that ultimately God is the one who looks out for me, not money. In Matthew 6, 25 through 34, Jesus talks about how the birds and flowers don't plant crops or spin clothes, but God still feeds and clothes them. So how much more will he take care of us? Obviously, this doesn't mean we can just sit back and do nothing and expect things to drop into our lap, but when things look bad, we can trust there is a God who loves us. The second principle of money I think is important is that even the money we have doesn't belong to us. Everything belongs to God, and we only have it because he's allowed it to be so. So when making money decisions, we're really using God's money, not our money. And that should help to inform our choices. Third big principle, money is a tool, not a goal. Money on its own is worthless. Why do you want random numbers in your bank account? It's only worth something because of purchasing power. So instead of making it our goal to accumulate wealth, we should think of money in terms of what we're looking to pursue in life, how we're trying to glorify God, and what amount of money it will take to accomplish the things that we want to accomplish not just aimlessly accumulating. So with those three things, let's get into four big aspects of managing money. Budgeting, giving, paying off debt, and saving. So let's start with budgeting. I hate that word. Sometimes I feel like people toss out budgeting as the cure-all. Oh, well, if you just budget. 
I want to be the first to say that sometimes budgeting isn't enough. Sometimes the money just can't possibly stretch to cover all the essentials. That's not a personal failing, that's just life. And I get it. I work multiple jobs for so many different companies and organizations. I do a lot of freelancing. I'm usually paid per project, so I take on as many as I can, be those articles, book coaching sessions, editing jobs, and that reliable bi-weekly paycheck doesn't exist for me. And I think that's true for a lot of us in this generation. It makes budgeting a nightmare, especially since some places can take anywhere from three weeks to two months to pay me for a job, and I have no idea how long it will end up being. I check the mail for checks every day, especially when it's getting close to time to pay bills. My childhood church absolutely loved Dave Ramsey and Financial Peace University, and my parents had great results from it. But a lot of the ideas of allotting specific amounts each month to certain kinds of expenses rests on knowing how much you'll make, which I and many other 20-somethings who work hourly or by the job just don't. So I think we need some alternate ways to do our budgeting. For me, I end up with a hierarchy of needs. So I start out by writing what checks I know for sure I'll be getting and which ones I may or may not be getting. I don't know when they'll come in. With the ones I know I'm getting, I start down the line of things I absolutely have to pay, like the rent and the utilities and the car insurance and the Wi-Fi. And then I need, like, my subscriptions to things like Adobe Suite and Acrobat DC and that sort of thing for my job. But if I get really desperate, I could drop a subscription, so those go a little bit lower down the list. I've dropped subscriptions before for programs like Canva or Photoshop and then pick them up again once I can afford them. And I have to eat, so a certain amount of money is grocery money and allotted as a necessary expense. And if I still have some money left of my, for sure, checks, we can add some wiggle room there to eat some nicer food. And sometimes my for sure checks don't cover the necessities, and I don't have a guarantee others will actually come in on time. So I have to sit down and figure out how much I'm going to have to make with some of my quicker turnaround jobs and how soon. So can I pull some extra hours here, snag an extra editing job there, and there go my evenings and weekend, but... I'll be able to pay the bills. Then I start in on what I can do if I get those other checks that I know are coming sometime in the next couple of months. So if I get this one, I can pay off this debt, or I can buy that ad spot that I need for my books, or the promo my publisher really wants me to participate in. I can buy some extra non-perishables for when things might get tighter next month, or I can buy a friend's book, or maybe just maybe I can put a little bit in savings. And I'm never going to be able to pay for everything I would like. Some things at the bottom of the hierarchy get pushed off for months and months and months. But the main bills get paid, and I know when I need to put in more overtime for them. So with that, let's move on to giving. When I was in junior high, senior high, I liked to make jewelry and sell it at craft shows. And I also did a lot of babysitting and eventually became a nanny. But until about my senior year of high school, I figured I didn't really need money, so I would just use all of my earnings to make care packages for the homeless, or donate to charitable causes, or etc, etc. And then college hit, and suddenly every cent had to go to tuition, then post-college, and it's hard to pay my own bills, let alone someone else's. So giving is something I still struggle with. How much am I supposed to give, and to what, and how often? Back then, I'd give away like 90% of everything I got and not worry about it because my parents took care of me. Obviously, that's not exactly feasible now. So the general rule for tithing is 10% of your income. But what if you don't have a home church? Where do you give? And what if that 10% means you're eating ramen seven days a week while your pastor drives a fancy sports car? Is that still ethical? So, because of all that, I don't think we can judge anyone else's giving. That's something between you and God. Some say tithing when you don't know whether you'll be able to eat or not is a sign of faith and God will provide, and some would disagree with that. But I think we can look at tithing in a broader sense. Are we, financially, trusting God and acknowledging His control? Are we using our finances to further the kingdom? 
And a lot of people might disagree with me, but I don't think a tithe has to be to a church. I think it can be to a charitable organization or to taking care of the homeless man down the street. And I don't think a tithe has to be money if you can't do that. If you have no money to give, you can always give your time or your services as a volunteer. A person with tons of wealth giving 10% to the church isn't really giving up nearly as much as a person with nothing who spends their evenings helping at a soup kitchen. Remember the story of the widow's offering in Mark 12. And obviously, in an ideal scenario, everyone should be at least tithing 10% of their church and doing some more stuff for charities, but when things are hard or confusing, I think we need to recognize that there are multiple ways in which we can honor God with our resources. So with that said, let's move on to paying off debts. And the Bible actually talks a lot about avoiding debt and compares being in debt to being enslaved in verses like Proverbs 22.7. And a lot of the Bible's sin imagery uses debt metaphors. My parents always taught me to avoid debt whenever possible. Buy the old car with the weird window that doesn't roll down and the funky smell instead of ending up with a car payment. Don't rack up credit card debt. If you're going to take out student loans, do so responsibly, and I know Dave Ramsey would say there's no such thing as a responsible student loan, but basically live simply now so you don't find yourself in a mountain of debt in the future. But what happens when you do have debt? Because it is hard to avoid. One thing my senior capstone professor taught us is how to prioritize knocking out debt. She said that you make your monthly payments on everything, but when you have some extra money, focus on one at a time, not just throwing extra at each of them. That way you can knock one out and have less interest rather than having more tabs linger around for longer. She suggested tackling your smallest balance first and working your way up, although other methods include tackling the one with the highest interest rate first. Considering that the Bible says the borrower is the slave of the lender, prioritizing getting rid of debt before making big purchases is wise. And finally, saving. You never know what might come up, so it's good to have some extra for a rainy day or to begin saving for the house, car, education, whatever it might be. And a quick glance at the book of Proverbs shows how much emphasis the Bible puts on prudence. Though we don't want to be misers hoarding money, the Bible also praises wise investors such as the servants with the talents or the ants in Proverbs 6. So how do we get to the point where we can even think about saving? Well, here are some little tips and tricks for you from someone who is terrible with money and needs lots of tips and tricks to keep myself in check. So the first thing that I think about and that you might want to think about is whether you're living within your means. And something I had to realize is that doesn't mean whether you think you're living reasonably or frugally. That's irrelevant. Can your paycheck support your however modest lifestyle? And friends are going to say, treat yourself, or that's a normal expense. You shouldn't feel bad about that, which is sometimes true. But I'm learning to take that with a grain of salt. Just because something should be a reasonable expense doesn't mean I can afford it. My biggest extravagance is food. I hate cooking, and I get bored with the sheer amount of bread and peanut butter I eat. So a couple times a week, I'll get food from someplace like Chick-fil-A or Panda Express. And am I aware that it would be much cheaper not to do this? Yes, I am very aware. But that part of me inside that hates cooking and wants to eat yummy things just screams, but it's food. You need food to live. You shouldn't need to feel bad about it. And in an ideal world, it shouldn't be a big deal. But in my world, I am, in fact, living beyond my means. And a lot of what we've been conditioned to believe is necessary, especially in American society, really isn't. So if you're struggling to pay the bills, are there some ways where, though the expense is technically reasonable, you're living beyond your means? So that leads into another big one for me. Impulse control. I've learned to sit on it when I want to buy something, anything. If I wait a couple of days, 99% of the time, I realize that I really don't need whatever thing I want to buy. 
So my rule for myself now is that if it isn't a household necessity like basic food items, soap, trash bags, etc., I have to wait a week and revisit whether I really need something. And occasionally I do decide that I need it. Like our backs were constantly hurting from our rock-hard hand-me-down love seat that was older than we were, so after months of complaining, my roommate and I finally bought a used couch off Facebook Marketplace. And we absolutely love it and fall asleep on it way too often. And sometimes I don't think through impulse buys and those impulse decisions come back to bite me for months and months and months. Like my cat's vet bills. A free kitten is not actually free. But I wouldn't trade him for the world and don't tell him I said that. This has been kind of a longer podcast for me, but there's one thing that I want to talk about still. Get rich quick schemes. I've tried quite a few in my day. They never work out. Also, the Bible lauds hard work. And if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Survey taking websites, MLMs, trying to become a social media influencer. Honestly, you've got a better chance of being struck by lightning than making a decent dollar from any of those. I'm a publicity manager for a publisher, and anytime someone talks about quitting their job and becoming a social media influencer, I just shake my head and sigh. Any author can tell you gaining followers is like pulling teeth, and part of my job is trying to help authors do that. It's hard. At the end of the day, finances stink. What's important is to live modestly and with integrity. Most of us will probably never be wealthy, so learning to manage what we have well in a way that honors God is time better spent than chasing the American dream. But it doesn't always have to be dismal, and budgeting time and money for relaxing and having fun is important too. And that's why I hope you'll tune in next time for episode 9, Party in the Pond, Having Fun the Healthy Way. If you want to connect with me, check out alyssarote.com, A-L-Y-S-S-A-W-R-O-T-E.com. Or check me out on Twitter, Insta, or Facebook at Alyssa Rote, A-L-Y-S-S-A-W-R-O-T-E. Until then, trust the captain of your boat and buckle in to weather the stormy seas under his guidance. Big Pond Little Fish is a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. If you enjoyed this episode, would you take a minute and leave us a rating and review in your favorite podcast app? It really does help more people like you find the show. You can find all of our episodes of Big Pond Little Fish by visiting lifeaudio.com. This episode was produced by me, Kelly Gibbons, and Steven Sanders. Special thanks to Stephen McGarvey for his executive oversight. You can find more faith-affirming podcasts like this one by visiting lifeaudio.com. <laughs>